Our next group of panelists have joined us from across the globe to speak about their research, as well as the activities of their respective networks. They'll be offering diverse perspectives on common issues, solutions, discoveries, and innovations. So I'm very pleased to uh, have Steve Cook here to moderate this panel, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Great, thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Really good to see all of you. So you just had uh, read to you what it says in the program, sort of what we're, what we're after here, but uh, I'll really boil it down to the fact that it's been a while since we've been together. Uh, I, you know, we've been trying to stay connected, but I'm interested in what all of you, what folks have been up to around the globe. And we've all faced different challenges and different opportunities over the last few years. And this really provides an opportunity for us to both reflect, but also at the same time, have a, a forward looking perspective. And so that's what we're going to try and do today. Uh, and this is very much an international panel. And that's where uh, I'm hoping you will take us with your questions. We welcome questions throughout. The second you put your hand up, I'm not necessarily going to come to you right away. So you may have to sit there. I'll, I'll try and acknowledge you if I see your hand up. I'll wait for an appropriate place to, uh, uh, to sub things in. We have a series of questions that we're going to work through here. But if there's fantastic questions coming to, through the uh, from the audience and helps us move through this in a, a lucid way, I'll, I'll certainly lean on, on you as much as I can can. So uh, I should probably say who I am. Again, Stephen Cook. I'm a professor at Carleton University, which is in Ottawa, Canada. And I'm also chair of the International Science Advisory Committee for OTN. And it's, a, again, a, a real pleasure to be here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a series of introductions where uh, my colleagues will spend a, a minute or two just introducing themselves and the networks. Everybody here is associated with one of the uh, uh, nodes or, or sister networks, if you will, of OTN. And so we're interested in, uh, in learning a little bit more about that. So we'll start off with uh, with introductions. Uh, as you can see, there's, there's four of us before you here, and we have uh, uh, somebody on the screen as well. So we'll start with our uh, virtual guest, and panelist, Dr. Chris Vandergoot. Chris, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks a lot, Steve. So as Steve alluded to, my name is Chris Vandergoot. I serve as the director of the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. Uh, I have an associate professor uh, designation at Michigan State University as well. But really, a, a lot of the work that I do emanates and comes from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. They made the strategic decision to bring acoustic telemetry to the Great Lakes Basin back in 2010. And so I'm the uh, second director since uh, the network started, so often referred to as GLaDOS. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. All right. Up next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frida Lara Lazardi. Uh, hello, I'm coming from Mexico. I'm part of Migramar, that is a network of researchers that work all the way from US to Chile. Uh, we have a, a network of receivers that cover Galapagos, Malpelo, Cocos, and Mexico. And yes, I'm very happy to share some of the experience that we have in that area. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Taryn Murray. Thanks, Steve. Um, sorry, you hear yeah, double, double doors of me. Um, I am Taryn Murray. I am a jack of all trades, I guess, my official position at the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, where I am based, um, is an instrument scientist, but that also includes student supervision, administration, science communication, anything. So whatever they need, I do. And on top of that, I manage the acoustic tracking array platform. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it covers about 2,200 kilometers of the approximately 3,500 kilometer coastline with massive listening, listening gap on the West Coast. Um, we currently have about 300 receivers in the water and we monitor 41 different species at the moment. So yeah, happy to always be here. We always learn a lot. Um, we are a fairly mature network. We first formalized our arrangement with OTN in 2011. So we are getting on in years, but always, always can learn new things. Wonderful. Thank you. And last, Dr. Tom Tinham. Hi, I'm the uh, data manager for a newly formed network in the Pacific. Um, we call it the Pirate Network. It's the Pacific Islands Region Acoustic Telemetry Network. Um, we 
think we first started up in March. So we have a few new projects and we're trying to get a lot more. So hopefully I have a little bit to contribute with a short, short uh, time span of experience in this. Great, Capacity. thanks. Thanks. And as you can see, we've got a, a diversity of uh, perspectives here, of course, from different regions, but people wear different hats in their roles within their respective organizations. And these organizations have existed for various periods of time from those that are, are really quite established to those that are, are really quite, quite new. So hopefully that will help to create a, a richness uh, for this discussion. And so the very first question that I'm going to pose to our panelists, everybody is going to uh, going to respond to. And after that, it'll be a little bit of a, you know, whoever whoever wants to, to weigh in here. But we're going to start with sort of a, a big picture one. And what has been or has the potential to be one of the most impactful management actions or science-based policy decisions resulting from your research outputs from the network. If you can talk about any lessons learned along the way, that would also be useful. And then of course, we also recognize some networks are brand new. And so maybe some of these things are, are in development as opposed to being able to point to something specific as of yet. So, so uh, perhaps we'll start with Taryn. Sure. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest things that we try to contribute to is marine protected areas or the designation of them or the expansion of existing areas. Um, it seems to be one of the management options that is relatively efficient in South Africa. Many other things um, like, let's call it estuarine protected areas, which we have fairly limited in the country, are difficult to manage and difficult to maintain, largely because the monitoring capacity is so limited. Um, so you end up with a lot of illegal unregulated fishing, which I don't think is specific to South Africa. I'm sure all of us experience this across the world, but the, the data is slowly being incorporated into specific plans that have been developed. And most recently there's been a shark conservation plan or a system, systematic conservation plan developed for sharks and rays in South Africa, looking at the endemicity of certain species. I think, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I think we've got something like 30% of the world's shark species occurring within our waters. Um, so this data has been incorporated into, into those kind of plans. And it, it's good to see that being used in that way. So for us, uh, MPAs and, and these kind of plans is, is definitely um, slowly coming to, to light but it's been a, a long time to get there. Great, thanks. Let's go to you next, Tom. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so as you mentioned, our network's still pretty young, but uh, one of the other hats I wear is I'm a member of the Hawaii Community Tagging Program team. Uh, and the, the main goal of that is to, to get tags in the hands of community fishers uh, because they interact with uh, sharks in such a large way. We primarily tag sharks. Uh, and that sort of, sort of brings it a community component to the tagging efforts uh, and it appears to be leading to uh, some goodwill and some willing adoption of, of uh, practices that mitigate mortalities in sharks. So for example, a uh, post-release mortality study done, this is with satellite tags, but we also deploy acoustic tags, a post-release mortality study uh, looking at how sharks respond to release with various types of uh, fishing leaders uh, led to the banning of uh, wire leaders in Hawaii's deep set long line fishery. Um, but because of the community components of that, that was adopted by the fishery about a year before legislation was passed. So I think that's a pretty great example of, of that sort of um, community bridge. Fantastic. All right, Frida. Well, uh, Migramar, I think, is very proud to share that um, we were able to expand a lot of the most important marine reserves in the region, in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Uh, to start with uh, Galapagos, and uh, recently there was expansion and the, the, the sonification of the connectivity, the migravia or swimway between Galapagos and Cocos. And this was based uh, mostly on satellite and uh, acoustic telemetry. So we have been able to show and prove that there are movements between two different countries. And they have been doing a very big effort in terms of like working together to plan uh, protection for the sharks in these two uh, borders. We also have um, the success of Malpelo that was recently expanded and achieved the goal of 30% of the protection for Colombia uh, in, the, in the ocean 
uh, territories for, for Colombia. In terms of Mexico, uh, we also use uh, acoustic telemetry to show the, connect the connectivity between the islands that are part of Revillagigedo Archipelago, that is uh, now the largest marine reserve in North America, as far as I know. <laughs> and this was created because of that. We had uh, te acoustic telemetry data between the different islands, and before we had six nautical mines that were protected just the, the, the core areas of the park. And we had a lot of tuna fishing boats uh, fishing around the islands. And we could uh, show the government that it was not enough. So with this new protection, we have 40 nautical mines uh, between each island. And at the end, they created a large polygon that uh, using Global Fishing Watch, we are able to prove that is respected. And uh, they are getting actually the benefits of it because they didn't reduce the, the amount of tuna that they, they are catching because actually the recruitment is still very high and they are getting the benefits of, of the reserve. In the future, we are working on also protecting Coiba Malpelo that connects uh, Panama and, and Colombia. And also in Mexico, we have a, a swimway that is in the Californian part that connects obviously U.S. with Mexico, and the one that is from uh, Revillagigedo to the Gulf of California. So we know a lot of the species are traveling between th these two different places, and there is a very large effort of Migramar. We have over 130 species of sharks and rays and also turtles, like George is doing a huge effort with turtles to try to prove these swimways, no? how species are moving between these marine reserves. And I, I can see Fred typing away as you're speaking, and that's because these examples are gold for us. Uh, when we go to our big funding bodies like CFI, yes, they want to see a, a nice long list of papers, but they also want to see that real world impact. And we've already heard a, a number of those all, already. Chris, I'm looking up to you. Okay. So with respect to actions that we've taken, I think one of the biggest things we've done is we've uh, change the way that we've deployed receivers in that we've not been focusing on deploying receivers just for project-based deployments. We've kind of stepped back and say, hey, what would be the greater good for covering the Great Lakes, you know, to understand fish movement better? And so that's allowed us to basically cover three of the five Great Lakes with receivers from anywhere from five to 15 kilometer spacing. And what that's done is that's allowed other researchers to join in and conduct studies at very fairly low cost because they know the receivers are out there, they're going to be maintained, and so they can build projects and they're not always concerned about whether or not somebody is going to be removing, changing the receiver arrays, you know, based on a particular project. Uh, with respect to, you know, policy decisions, I think what it's what the telemetry has done, it's really changed the conceptual model of how a lot of native and invasive species in the Great Lakes uh, uh, are moving throughout the system. You know, we struggle with controlling sea lamprey, and now there's this uh, there's uh, in, there's concern that Asian carp uh, are would potentially get into the basin, and so uh, they're using this telemetry to really understand how these fish are moving to, you know, to inform management actions for like control. And then when it comes to native species, uh, you know, are the boundaries that are being set up appropriate for these different species, uh, uh, you know, for when it comes to native species restoration. And I think one of the um, lessons we've learned along the way is that we, we want to involve managers from the get-go. So when projects are first designed until, you know, the completion, we have managers participating in this the whole way through so that we make sure that the the man the questions that we're asking are the ones that managers really want to have answered and that's what's pressing you know on on their agenda great thanks chris and so when i reflect on the answers from all of our panelists i think one of the themes that certainly jumps out is that idea of partnerships and collaboration or in an ideal world co-production uh, working hand in hand with those that have a, a, a stake uh, or rights to a, a given resource, uh, some the so-called end, end users at, at some point. Um, I think the other thing I, I just want to highlight is that 
we're not so good at telling these stories. We're good at writing up the, the science piece. And there's a disconnect because oftentimes it's, you know, months, if not years later that those policy changes occur and the student has fledged, you're on to the next project. So if you have these success stories or partial successes, you know, we, we learn from failures as well. There's opportunities to, to share, but I would encourage you to think about writing some of that up as case studies or reflective articles that, that, that really uh, capture that and, and share it. Because right now, if you, there's again, tons of telemetry papers out there, but uh, as Jordan showed us this morning, it, it, it tends to mostly be on sort of the, the science side, and we don't have necessarily as many examples that show that right through to the application and actual change in management, change in policy, change in Fisher behavior, and so on. So, so thanks for taking time to share those examples with us. Um, building on that, uh, I think where you know arrays and programs evolve, some are still being being built. Um, I'd I'd like to hear from you what you see as the biggest gaps or challenges with your respective networks, and it doesn't have to be a gap as in we want more receivers to fill that hole over there, but just in in general. So. Uh, Frida, can I start with you? Yes. Uh, well, in the network, I think it depends a lot and relies on, for, for example, we were talking with uh, Kirsten that is here from Peru. Uh, and a lot of this is not just, just the network, but it's also the, the, the amount of budget that we have to maintain and to work with the communities in order to really be able to sustain the project for many years. That is actually the main goal. So in Mexico, there is a very strong network, but we see that we have big gaps in, for example, in, in Guatemala and Nicaragua. There are countries where we know it's very important because we see that they have a lot of very unknown species or uh, with data deficient species, but the efforts is still very low and the budget is also very uh, limited. But we know for sure if we want to cover the whole area in terms of the swimways and these corridors, we have to work a lot and put a lot of effort in species that are not as charismatic or we don't have enough information about them. And in these specific places, in these countries that are, uh, they have some limitations in terms of the universities or the budget that they can reach. So yes, that, that will be very, very important. Great. So with this one, not everybody has to answer. So I'm going to look at my panelists and see if anybody wants to jump in on, on this one. Somebody that has something different to offer, a different perspective. Yeah, I, Tim? I think it's actually in contrast to what you said. I think we actually have literal gaps in our uh, our ability to monitor fish movements in the Pacific, even with a, a growing network. Uh, we don't have a contiguous coastline uh, across which you have multiple research groups. We have uh, you know, for example, you have the Hawaiian Archipelago, where you have relatively well-funded research groups who are studying anything from reef fish to highly migratory projects. And then you have researchers in places like Guam or Saipan who are largely interested in their reef fish fisheries. They don't stand to benefit all that much from pelagic infrastructure. And so we need to try to find ways to create a large network that they can benefit from on a sort of small or meso scale, or at least fish movements maybe among islands uh, within their archipelagos rather than the benefits of, you know, hundreds of receivers in Hawaii that might be thousands of kilometers away. Um, that's one of the things that I, I'm going to try to <laughs> try to work on uh, through meetings with some of these people right. in these different areas. Do you have any receivers you can smuggle home in your bag? Yeah, yeah that'll go right. well. All right. Uh, Taryn or Chris, anything you'd like to add? Taryn? Um, I think with us, it is largely a lack of capacity as well. The, the research telemetry, the, the telemetry research group in South Africa is very small. And pretty much everybody that does research in the country is part of ATAP. And we all play nice with each other, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so it, it it is quite a... Not a frustrating it's just uh you know building capacity takes time and trying to find people and money for people is is a big thing so we we don't seem to have a problem with acquiring more infrastructure and expanding the network from a receiver perspective but it's more people that are able to help and to come on board in terms of that and also just in terms of the species that are currently monitored they are 
great. Um, many of them are reef endemic reef fish species. Um, not necessarily quite heavily targeted by the recreational fishers. Um, a lot of species also uh, targeted by the subsistence fishers, particularly estuary associated species, where many of the stocks are currently collapsed. Um, but there's very little information on species that are targeted commercially. Besides fishery data, the, there is zero movement information on many of those species. Yellowtail, for example, which are a global species, there's literally no information on their movements in South Africa. And we know we know that that's a blaring gap. So I think in terms of again linked to funding and personnel, they're just these missing missing places, which would be nice to fill. Sounds good. Thanks. So Steve, just real quickly building on what Taryn said in terms of you know having the people for to analyze data. You know, tagging fish isn't generally a problem for us. We can train people how to track tag fish in you know relatively short period of time. What we're finding is it we're 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 looking for people who can analyze complex data sets. For example, how do you uh, determine how fish are relating to abiotic conditions? You know, whether it be hypoxia or nutrients or things like that. Like so, melting fish movement data as long with abiotic conditions in the lakes because that's really what the managers are wanting they they want to understand how these changes in the climate are going to affect their fisheries moving forward so finding individuals with that skill set as i think our our biggest challenge as long as, as well as like with certain population demographic uh, uh parameters that you want to estimate like fishing mortality natural mortality and things like that yep Thanks, Chris. And I think that, that connects to some of the discussions we had yesterday at our ISAC meeting, uh, where we were talking about Aaron Fisk was talking about uh, the importance of bringing in environmental data sets. You heard Jake amplify that today uh, um, in talking about uh, the habitat side of things. But also going back to the first question today, which was about application and management policy, trying to be more timely, trying to get information to folks more quickly. And so what Chris brought up with these, you know, the capacity for, for data analysis, it, it's also probably increasing the speed at which that can be done, at least in a rudimentary way, so that that can be uh, harnessed by, by managers. So uh, yeah, I think that all of us could probably reflect on the arrays or, or networks that we're involved with and find issues with capacity, issues with, I think yours is really about sustainability in the long run and also working across boundaries. Uh, and then again, still trying to fill in those those literal holes in our in our our uh, tracking infrastructure. All right, I just want to take a pause and scan the audience here to see if there's any any hands, uh, questions, or or thoughts at this point that organically fit with anywhere we've gone so far. If not, I've got more questions. Go ahead up here. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting. I, uh, I have a question for Frida. I think this is very fascinating that your um, research eventually led to the expansion of marine protected area. And then you mentioned a little bit on the financial and cost. I would like to know more a little bit like um, uh, so far, like uh, how did you manage to maintain that MPA that you just expanded? Um, you know, especially I think in the monitoring and uh cost is really high um especially for sharks like this and then when it comes to the expansion did you see any social implications to it especially with the people who might be really dependent on the sharks um because some of that you mentioned actually are very commercial ones um so yeah i just wanted to hear more about it thank you Yes, so as, as you were mentioning, it's very important that we start like connecting uh, policy making and telemetry and I think when we propose a new expansion or we work for a bigger uh, protection, uh, we have to work a lot on uh, creating the baseline. And from there to show to the government and the decision makers that that decision was good and was positive and actually is helping the communities. So being able to show it with telemetry no? and also to be able to show, for example, mixing uh, the fishing effort and the telemetry data is very powerful in terms of decision-making. 
So we are working very close with Global Fishing Watch. We have some agreements signing with them. And we also push the governments and we work with the ministers of fisheries to try to convince them to use those new tools in, er in order to be able to um, sustain these big, big marine reserves. No? Because as you were saying, we are in developing countries. We need a lot of budget in order to really enforce these large areas. But if you use technology and you use uh, meaningful data, then it's very, like, it's straightforward. They, they get convinced and they work on that with you. Yeah. And I, I just want to make a connection to Danielle's talk from this morning, as uh, this afternoon, uh, as well. So where you've got Western Dry Rocks uh, off Key West as an example, where telemetry was one of the tools that led to the creation of a protected area and is now being used to evaluate it. But there's no certainty that that will exist, that that uh, protected area will be maintained if it turns out that, in fact, it's not functioning. So I think we're seeing that it being used for sort of both perspectives to both create or identify uh, or to inform the siting side of things, but then to evaluate success and and uh, the longevity of, of these approaches. All right. Any other questions before we move along, Fred? <laughs> okay um this is addressed to the entire panel and it's what do you think would be the biggest mistakes that we or read i could make here on the otn side that would negatively impact your networks things that we would say things that we would do and how would i avoid making those mistakes <laughs> cool so i i think that's a really interesting question come i'm trying to give you a second here to think uh, <laughs> uh you know where otn very much plays a supporting role and you know, you're the the boots on the ground in your respective regions and so uh yeah great great question um taryn can i start with you <laughs> Uh, I have to start somewhere. Sure. <laughs> um, maybe for us, just in terms of equipment, please, please don't ask for your, your equipment back. That, that, would, that would be a good start. <laughs> so, so, so the way that the for, for, for history of ATAP, the way it started was a, a hardware. Um, it, well, we got equipment from OTN, and that's essentially where we built our entire network from. And I think it was... I can't remember if had like a hundred receivers or something, I think. So from that, we built the, the array to what it currently is um, with partner receivers, uh, partner partners coming on board as well, who contribute their own receivers to the network. So for us, that would be a big thing for starters. <laughs> um, I will do some more thinking and, and get sure. back to that. Chris, I'm going to come to you next. Yeah, so I think the one of the biggest, you know, I mean, other than being a great bunch of people to interact with, I think one of the biggest services OTM provides is when it comes to the data management, you know, when I go across North America and I'm talking to groups about, you know, GLaDOS and how it works, how individual researchers upload their data to the web, and then they're able to just pull down their own tag detection data that blows their mind for people like working in the Mississippi River, the Tennessee River, and these large connected systems. So uh, OTN's developing, you know, that whole database, that whole database structure and providing support to me is, uh, you know, that just it's invaluable. So and then I guess moving forward is how you can stand that up for other groups would be, you know, highly advantageous, right? Like it's hard to make a leap that, you know, a Mississippi River, Tennessee River would have much of a connection with OTN, right? But providing that resource and teaching people how to do that is would be is a huge huge advancement because these poor folks are like sending around csv files right a, a, you know saying hey we're duplicates and whose fish is this and i just like kind of like walk out of the room quietly i'm like yeah we don't have to worry about any of that so i think that's one of the biggest contributions otn has you know to the community right thanks tom yeah i i, I would agree um i we talk about the benefit of these networks as you know they cover a large spatial scale and they allow people to to collaborate over that but these projects now cover a large temporal scale too so just continuing what you're doing even if it doesn't contain lots of bells and whistles and it doesn't have lots of features it, just having a stable network that continues to support these long-term studies is really really important 
yeah, the word stability. I think that's a that's a a good one. Yep. I will just uh, like I've been talking with Caitlin. Uh, when you have a lot of researchers trying to collaborate, it's very important to work and be very clear and transparent about the policy data. So uh, for for me, grammar is very important that we we know the value of sharing information, but also it's very important that everyone trusts on the information that is shared now because it's a big effort for us to enable to to have the support to tag animals to maintain the receiver is a huge effort most of this uh, is not funded by the government it's funded by ngos so uh, i i i see how the researchers effort a lot in order to get the, that data and it's, it's super valuable for them so it's it, like having you and knowing that we can trust on your server for sharing all that and getting the benefits of it. It's very important for us. Fred, I'm gonna take chair's privilege here and also add something. And I think that it's really about building that sense of community or community of practice. And so if things like these sessions were to disappear or uh, other opportunities for us to inter interact informally or formally, I think that's why I really like being part of OTN and having my team members in, involved because uh, you know that enriches their experience and everybody is so open and willing to share, but those the fora for doing so has to be provided. And I think OTN does a, a good job of that. And Taryn, you've got something else there. Yeah, sorry, Steve. I was just thinking now, um, Fred, another another great aspect um, which, which I found very helpful is all the policies that are currently in place and applications and agreements and, and everything like that. The, the I want to say standard paperwork involved in running these things for us it's been really valuable to build our policies and things off that so um, just having a, a global network saying these are the things and practices that we follow it's been very helpful for us to be able to to develop off that first time anybody's ever said no <laughs> more bureaucracy <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only because I it's only because I do it now <laughs> You could still retract that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm going to move us along. We've got a, another question here. And this one's about connectivity. And I know connectivity is core to what we do when we're thinking about animal movements and, and tracking. But I want to think about connectivity across boundaries. And so one of the, the most obvious boundaries that we often encounter is the, the freshwater to freshwater to marine boundary, and I know those are called estuaries, but the reality is that if you do work in fresh water, you oftentimes publish in different journals and may attend different conferences than folks that do work in, in the marine realm. And there's even a group that just does estuarine work and so on. And then similarly, we've got people that work in near shore coastal marine environments. We've got folks that work in the high seas, and those are all very different conceptually in, in, in some ways, or at least we as, as as academics, of managers have sort of parsed them off and thought of them as, as different pieces. So I'm interested as somebody that works in both the freshwater and marine realm, how we break down those barriers. And I know O and OTN stands for ocean, but I'm always harping that it, it's it's really an A, it's about aquatic. We've got work, we've got Chris on board here from uh, the, the, the Great Lakes and other folks uh, we've heard today uh, doing freshwater work. So how do we, work across those boundaries and and think about um how we how we study animals i'm trying to understand the importance of the connections among those system components and so on so yeah i'm going to start with you chris uh yeah so i i don't know that i ever would envision that there's the potential would exist to follow a fish say like an atlantic salmon or an american eel that was tagged or resided in Lake Ontario that you could follow it out to the sea almost seamlessly and now today you can through the Great Lakes uh through GLaDOS and then the OTN and the receivers so I, I think that's just mind-blowing I mean unfortunately a lot of time the players involved in these two systems don't go to the same meetings and so I think intentionally sitting down and figuring out who needs to be you know, getting together is is a huge thing. And I think OTN can help facilitate that. And, you know, because we're in contact with OTN a lot, we try to help facilitate that as well. You know, I got to be careful where I put receivers because I, I don't want to go outside the jurisdiction of the Great Lakes. I, I may cheat the line there once in a while. Um, but 
venues like this are, are, are I think, are, are very valuable for doing that. And I know Steve has got a project going on, I believe, with American Eel to that to this effect in the St. Lawrence River. So, yeah, I mean, I, anytime you can, you know, bridge those gaps, I think it's important because, again, at the end of the day, it goes back to a better understanding of the conceptual model of what these organisms are doing and then what might be hindering, uh, you know, conservation efforts. And that's, you know, those are two species, American eel and, Amer and Atlantic salmon that, you know, there certainly are, there's work underway with those species. Great, thanks, Chris. Anybody else wanna jump in on that one? Uh, well, in terms of what we are studying, uh, we know for sure that some of the species that are super important for the project are, for example, hammerheads. And, uh, and a lot of these sharks uh, are, living in starting their life cycle in the mangroves no so if we don't consider all the protection and all the management of the estuaries or the like marine lagoons and all these systems we are missing a critical part of the projects no so we focus a lot on the oceanic islands because it's easier because there is less people but now migramar is recognizing the efforts in the coastal areas and we want to start working closer to the communities in Colombia, in, in all these areas where we have the mangroves, no? So if we wanna really close the cycle, we have to start working with the communities. It's hard because we have countries where there is like a lot of social issues, but I think working with the community and finding this is, is, is a challenge, but we are aware that it's, it's very important. Great, thanks. Either of you like to weigh in or are you happy? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so the, the ATEP, although most of our receivers are in the marine environment, very near shore environment, um, we've got 20 estuaries that are currently monitored. Um, they're over 300 in the country, so it's it's a fraction. But the estuaries we monitored are, monitor are large permanently open estuaries because we've got estuaries of varying types uh, in South Africa. And a lot of the work that Paul and the group has done um, is, and that's just one research group, specifically have looked at estuary associated species and particularly juveniles of those species. So animals that come uh, spawn at sea, the juveniles recruit back into estuaries. That's where they stay for their nursery phase for one to three years. And then they move back out into the marine environment or they hang around in the estuary for ages. And a lot of the work, um, which I showed that little animation in the Breda estuary, it's it's becoming more apparent how important these systems are to large adults as well. So we've always had a, a strong estuary marine connectivity focus on our research. We're starting to try to branch out between estuary freshwater um, connectivity, although the rivers are very short and very we're very water scarce um, in South Africa as well. But we're starting a new project on some cathedral species, so species of mullet and uh, African longfin eel as well. So that'll be really interesting. Um, but following on your comment about attending different conferences, that's very much a common occurrence um, with us where the marine crowd goes to a certain conference and the freshwater crowd attends an another conference, even though the one is, the freshwater is aquatic science. So it's not limited to freshwater, but it's kind of been dubbed the freshwater conference. So um, I think breaking through that, connecting those two conferences would, would definitely open up some good possibilities to future collaborations. Good. Thanks. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, two two things. Um, so, so a lot of well, for, for at least Hawaii, um, the watershed is is a pretty important land division in Hawaiian culture, the ahupua, and basically is represented by the land that is between two ridge lines and leads down to the the ocean's edge, uh, and that's how it was historically managed and. One of the more timely issues now is the restoration of these um, coastal fish ponds that were really important in Hawaiian traditional cultural practices. Uh, and those are associated with things like taro patches that were upstream and um, the fish that were raised in those sort of weird off fish ponds were really important for subsistence. And there's a push to restore a lot of these habitats. And so wherever you find watersheds or at least transitional zones that are not occupied by the Navy in Hawaii, uh, you find either old fish ponds that are ruined or developed or ones that are being restored. Um, so in that way, those transitional zones are sort of inextricably linked to, to uh, traditional cultural practices. And so I think the conversation about work that gets done in those areas has to involve those voices. Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about is kind of a plug for a, a pet topic that I 
I currently don't know of anything um, that's being done involving it, but uh, ankyline cave systems. So they're a heavily understudied uh, transitional zone, but it, because they're very difficult to study unless you're a highly experienced cave diver. Uh, there are a lot of fish that utilize these areas. Uh, I think in the, the um, Gulf Coast of Mexico, in the cenotes, you have endangered uh, blind uh, catfish. Mm -hmm. A lot of potential for work to be done there, but I just don't know how you do it without putting your life in peril. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to come to the audience again in a minute. So if you have any questions or anything you'd like to bring to the conversation, please put your hand up now and we can start moving the microphone towards you. There's Jake in the middle. Um, before Jake goes, I want to add in a, another boundary that I don't think we've done a good job of crossing, and that's the aquatic to terrestrial boundary. And uh, I know when we talk about protected areas, we're all heard times talking about in the context of of a, a fisheries management tool to you know reduce uh, harvest or over over harvest. But we're also seeing a lot of protected areas put in, particularly in Canada, by organizations like Parks Canada, and they care as much about the frogs as they do the the fish. And so thinking about things from an ecosystem perspective, I think there's a lot of room to start. And it, it's not necessarily going to be acoustic telemetry because we're talking about about birds. We're talking about about uh, amphibians, we're talking about terrestrial mammals and so on, and so, uh, and even insects. So uh, there's a, a, a ton of work being done to track uh, various uh, uh, flying insects these days and crawling insects. So, um, so point is that I think that's another, you know, you know I, I'm unaware of, of much in that space. And I could imagine us being 10 years down the road and seeing some really synthetic work being done bringing together different technologies because not one is going to to work in in all of those domains but i think that would be fascinating everyone uh great panel so far um <clears throat> we're in a point where um there's more and more capacity to do synthesis activities with the the growing telemetry data sets that we have and there's a few different ways of doing that and historically i think most of the time networks kind of provide the authors with some general information like, oh, these are the people you need to talk to. And they kind of self-organize and share the data. But more recently, I've seen OTN facilitating uh, giving people actual access to people's repositories to pull data from. And so there's different ways of doing it. And there's kind of this general balance where between being really open and sharing and doing these syntheses, but also people being a little bit more protective of their data because they want to have some control and they want to publish things, you know, and not get quote unquote scoops. So I was just wondering if you have any opinions or experience on how we can better facilitate or best facilitate synthesis activities. Right. Good question. So you deal with data. Do you want to, uh, <laughs> you want to start with that one? <laughs> I think, I think Chuck said it earlier, just given voice to my nightmare. That's, I think about that a lot. Um, <laughs> it is, it is, I don't know if I have a good answer for it because I'm, I'm currently, um, you know, currently involved in data sharing for one of these big synthesis things, and they're, you know, I'm fully supportive of it, but there's still a small part of me that says, oh, no, no, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want to share it. Maybe you want to hold on to it. And that, I don't know if it goes beyond a, a knee-jerk reaction, but I, I don't know how you find a balance for that. It, it, and it's hard to incentivize other people who might be at the other end of the spectrum. They're they're barely willing to step their, you know, dip their toe into the idea of being part of a network and then convincing them to be a part of a much larger census thing seems like a really tough, <laughs> tough thing to do. Fred had his hand up, so we'll go to him next so we can continue to think. <laughs> so, so, Jake, with regards to the question you asked from the OTN perspective, I think the simple answer is never stifle initiative. What we have done to facilitate is when somebody has come forward with an idea that made sense, it was going to be good for the world writ large, we will facilitate that one. And I have done a lot of that, of contacting individual investigators, somebody saying somebody wants to move this one forward. Would you play? Would you participate? Um, we back away immediately if somebody says no. I do not want to play. There's no further pressure. It's it's not a pressure game. It's just here's an opportunity. You can become part of something that's bigger. But the initial approach is a champion that comes forward with the idea to do it and has the idea. 
Chris, I know you've been dealing with some of these lake-wide syntheses. We've got some people in this room working on those. Yeah, so that's it, that, that's interesting. Like, so you always hear the, the one of the fears about sharing data is that you're going to get scooped, and I don't know, to be honest with you, that that's a big concern that I've heard in our network. I think the bigger concern I've heard from the PIs on the projects is, yeah, but they don't understand how the data was collected, or they don't understand the nuances associated with, you know, how this. Uh, contingent of the population, whether it was early in the spawning run or late in the spawning run. And what they're afraid is, is that their data is going to be misused, not that they're going to get scooped. And so we've been trying to think about how to deal with that. And um, we haven't come up with a great solution. We always have people saying, hey, is the GLaDOS data available? And we're like, yeah, if you reach out to the PIs and start talking with them, Yes, it, it, you know, it will be available when you start developing a relationship. Interestingly, that's where the conversation often stops. They don't go that second step. It's almost, some of them is just like, they literally are just want data to monkey around with to see if they can find anything. And so I think that is the, you know, quasi most dangerous type. So it, it, we haven't, I don't think we've gotten our heads around this one fully yet. And, and maybe we're still young in our organization for this to really happen. Because, you know, like in Lake Erie, you know, in a lot of these lakes, we've got five or six different species that are making very large spatial movements. And that would be, you know, tremendously interesting, you know, to start synthesizing and analyzing that data from that perspective. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, one of Vivian's papers, the to share or not to share. And, uh, um, I, I recall one of the questions being about, you know, you know, have you been scooped? And I think there are based virtually no examples of being scooped, yet a reasonable proportion of the respondents were concerned about being scooped. So there's sort of a, a bit of a, a disconnect. But I think some of the, the other themes that have come up here were anything else that came, I, I'm trying to remember any other I can't really remember. I know I pulled it up when we were at ISAC to just sort of remind myself. Um, but then on the flip side, there were lots of information about rewards or or potential benefits from sharing too. So there's both sides of the coin. So maybe amplifying some of that those benefits or rewards of sharing data could be a potential solution to finding that balance. Yeah. I don't know. And as we were talking about Isaac, you know, it's, you know, one bad actor can sort of disrupt the apple cart and then that can affect relationships and stories get told and things can spin off. So, you know, one, one, one misstep can sometimes have, have ripples that, that, you know, that, that really influence more than just the, the person that was immediately affected and, and changing other behaviors. So I think that's probably something that just as a community, we need to think about. This is something that obviously deserves a lot more time and, and thought. Yeah. Thanks for raising that, Jake. So on the note of sharing data or not, like at least in Norway, we use many different manufacturers uh, on different research groups. And we kind of get these dilemmas of not all of the manufacturing having the open protocols. So we sort of have unexploited opportunities for collaborations across different research groups. So what are your thoughts on how we sort of can cope with us as individual researchers or as a whole uh, network here? Yeah. Anybody want to weigh in on that one? Anybody dealt with? compatibility issues. So Steve, yep. I, I, to personally, at the end of the day, I, I think it comes down to just the trust that there is among uh, uh, researchers. I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, it's more of, hey, have I built a good relationship with this individual? Do I feel confident and comfortable working with them? 
because I think that goes a long way. I think people are, 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 are way more willing to put their defenses down when they say, hey, this individual has higher integrity and they're good to work with. I think a, a lot of those issues, you know, you know, kind of just resolve themselves, to be honest with you. And with respect to some of the, the technical issues that you brought up, I think, you know, Europe is sort of a, a test case for that. And so I think there's been some, some both baby steps and big steps in, in, in terms of trying to, to get some inter sort of operational capability there. And so uh, just because there's so many jurisdictions with so many different organizations and a variety of manufacturers all sort of playing in the same space, I think that that's sort of, you know, where this is sort of playing out most acutely at this point in time. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to our next question, which uh, in many ways we've started to go down this path a little bit already. And that's about the approaches that you or your network use to transfer or to provide access to the knowledge gained to those who really need it most uh, and aren't necessarily embedded right within the research community. So decision makers, coastal members of coastal communities, uh, fishing industry uh, and rights holders. Uh, I, I don't have necessarily the, the right panel here to, to really delve into the rights holder side of things. I think we dealt with that nicely this morning. So, uh, but those are some of the 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 uh, so-called user groups that we're thinking about here. So, interested in what your respective networks have been doing to uh, to really help to get the information from beyond the page and into the hands of of those end users so tom um so there's there's two main groups that uh, our network currently is in conversations with uh, and that we would plan to continue interacting with in the future one is the our regional fisheries management council uh obviously you just have the the council at those meetings but you have members of the fishing community that are there as well and i uh we've made a few presentations to them kind of letting them know what the the network is about uh the type of work that we do and uh, our, our willingness to sort of involve fishers and, and tagging efforts and, and examples of how that can be beneficial to them. Uh, our parent organization, PACIOS, is one of the, the regional observation networks, uh, and they will hold re <laughs> sub-regional meetings at some of the different, um, in some of the different island states. So uh, recently there was, there was one in uh, Guam. Uh, and so we make presentations there and we we discuss some of the, the opportunities to work and and hopefully receive some feedback or some uh, insights into what would be valued or useful for them or what they would like to see. We're kind of in an interesting stage where we can make this network what we what we want it to be or what they want it to be. Great. Thanks. Frida. Um well we have different yeah, we, we work in different ways. For example, um, we work with uh, the policymakers in different countries. We try a lot of these initiatives need a lot of political willing, and they have. We have to deal with political interest too. So in some of these countries, is is a very long process. It has been taking many years. For example, the swimway between Cocos and Galapagos took more than 10 years to be able to really work on that. So you have to bring in the conversation different uh, directors of the park and to involve them in the whole process, no? So when they see you setting the receiver, sometimes they come and help you to tag the sharks and everything. They feel part of the process. And then when you th they see the results, they feel that they feel proud of, of what the, all the effort, no? So what we do in Migramar is to bring them on board, for example, in some of the expeditions. It's not because it's mandatory, it's, it's also part of the strategy, no? Or to bring uh, some key people, like Max Bello has been a key, important person that is very uh, known for different um, countries and governments. So they can be the advisors for the ministers of fisheries and, and try to be um, always very scientific, try to be very objective. And even that obviously Migramar is always uh, trying to find the conservation of these shark or race species, uh, base our uh, ideas and statements on, on science, no? 
So, so bringing that into the conversation is very important and having the data and very powerful uh, tools, maps that can be shown with the political, with the decision makers is, is very important, I think. Great visuals to really help with yeah. that storytelling. Chris, I think you're gonna probably amplify that point knowing you. Yeah, so um, I alluded to this earlier, and that was, you know, getting the managers involved. In the Great Lakes, each lake has its own what we call lake committee, and then each lake committee has its own technical group of experts, and in some lakes, it's more uh, parsed out with species than others. But what we've found is, is that working closely with the biologists, you know, who are charged with managing these populations that has been the best way to get our telemetry results into their hands because biologists talk a lot to their supervisors and supervisors if they're good supervisors are listening to what their biologists are saying because they're the ones on the ground you know someone like me i'm very dis disjunct from a lot of the research these days right uh, as a director so that's the tactic we've taken. And, you know, uh, in the audience today is Aaron Fisk and uh, Tim Johnson, I believe. They would be great people to talk to at a break to kind of get a better understanding of how, you know, it kind of works in the Great Lakes and what we've found to be um, the most effective. You know, I asked one of our biologists, Tom Binder, I said, you know, how do we know when we're being effective as a telemetry group and as a research group? And he just, without hesitation, said, when they're coming to us with project ideas and I just said yep that's exactly right so I think that's kind of what we focus on in my opinion the papers and the scientific uh, outputs will come if we hire good people but you know making sure the network is sustainable long term that's kind of what I focus on on, on, on a daily basis and, and that for us is getting the input and the um, advice from the managers all the way at the ground up I'm going to go to Taryn next, um, but just flag that if, uh, so we've got a, a, I think I saw a hand here. We'll come to you after. Um, so yeah, just to add on what everybody else said as well, um, is to target the recreational anglers themselves. Um, there are probably about a million recreational anglers in the country at the moment. And one of the the, the big roles that um, my, my colleague did, uh, Paul Cowley, he started a whole bunch of catch and release angling clinics, or we call them CARA clinics. And he successfully managed to convince an entire fishing um, community and group on one of the estuaries in the country, which is home to uh, the large dusky cob. It's, it's one of the last strongholds in the country. He managed to convince that whole angling community who used to have an annual fishing competition on the estuary to change their competition from catch and kill to catch and release and it, it really using the telemetry data actually showing the anglers look your fish stay here all the time take these fish out there's going to be nothing left so actually having that data to back up those clinics and those workshops really helped change the mindset of the recreation recreational anglers in that specific or who operate on that specific estuary so you know, getting buy-in from the people that use the resources, just getting a change in mindset has, has also um, been uh, a, a side on <laughs> from the telemetry data. So uh, yeah, that's that's been been really good for us. Thanks, Joy. I, I, sorry, oh. I, can, I, can I just yep. one thing? Uh, showing the results of, for example, uh, I was telling some of the persons that we, we had a population of giant mantas in the Gulf of California and they disappeared for 20 years and they just came back and sharing the telemetry data to the community, to the, the people in La Paz is super important because they feel proud of those mantas. So they feel attached to these animals and even the fishermen, they are like, I want to know which, like, what is this manta doing? No? So it can create um, a sense of uh, feeling proud of it and also responsible about these animals. So it's very powerful. Thank you, Joy. Um, can I be really bold for a second? Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a new tool that we're really excited about. This is Joy talking about uh, facts. So um, can I answer this? Just, just this one. Please do. Um, so we recognize that we don't do a very good job about you know taking data and turning it into information that is usable by the general public. And also, even though individuals within the network interacted with our fisheries management councils would be there for stock assessments, things like that, 
they, the management councils were still lacking information. They might come and say, you know, do you have information on this species? Do you have information on this species? They just, that there was a disconnect there, not knowing all the research that was going on. Plus by the time you publish, that can be years after a study is done. Um, so we created a, a tool, it's a um, online data visualization. It's called the Davit. Uh, you can look it up on the Facts of Cora website. So it's, uh, it's made for the general public that they can visualize, uh, I'll put air quotes on range and distribution of species. And it is um, backed from one of the nodes. So the data that are actually reflected are every time the node is updated, it's there. So it's not after a project, um, but it is provided in a way that uh, protects scientists and what their ongoing studies are, but also again, is informational to the public and is informational to the stakeholders. And we have actually, you know, we, uh, Danny was on this project with several people here were on the project with us. Um, and we took a long time getting buy-in, but now we have 90% of the projects that are opting in to have their data displayed in that way. So we're like super excited about it. We're actually in like second version. OTN has had a vital role in getting it off the ground and getting it functioning. So, um, sorry, I just had to talk about it because we're really excited. Yeah. Uh, and yesterday uh, at the council, uh, or uh, the council, the uh, uh, ISAC committee, we talked about uh, that as well. And how in particular in the US now, there's a presidential order about how it's not just a matter of about making data open and available, it's doing it in a timely manner uh, as, as <laughs> uh, again, vague, but uh, the point is, uh, you know, what we're thinking of in terms of embargoes may not work uh, in the future with the continued push for, for open data, particularly in, in governments. So, all right. Steve, Steve, could I jump in real quick? Yes. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're doing is, uh, or we're hoping to do in the near future is uh, we're setting up a real-time receiver with Karen Murchie. You're looking at uh, sucker movements in and out of one of the tributaries of the Great Lakes. And so the whole point of this, in addition to helping Karen with her research is to bring awareness about the, you know, some of these you know, less known species in the Great Lakes. And so to that end, we're, what we're hoping to do is develop like a kiosk type thing at a local museum, and then also partnering with the Shedd Aquarium, where this project can be highlighted, you know, to, so people can actually see these fish moving up and out of the tributary, but also provides us an opportunity in a big venue like the Shedd Aquarium, where they get, you know, I don't know, you know, tens of thousands of visitors, I think, on an annual basis on, you know, the importance of native fish species in the Great Lakes and freshwater systems, because, you know, for whatever reason, walleye are not as attractive as great white sharks swimming around in the you know, crystal blue ocean. Although I would argue they're just as important as an apex predator. But anyway, so this is kind of a unique, this is a kind of a non-traditional way for us to kind of get some of that science out there. And we're hoping that that will, uh, you know, kind of uh, expose people who may not be uh, able to understand, you know, what's going on in their Great Lakes in a little bit different way. I think what I heard Chris asking for was a walleye on here next year. <laughs> All right, we are going to transition to what is the, the last question here. And I'm gonna take us back to the beginning. I sort of frame this around the fact that we haven't been together for a, a while. And, and I wanna preface this also by saying that it's been a difficult three years and, uh, and it continues. So uh, again, with colleagues spread around the world, uh, there have been all sorts of challenges that we have faced and continue to face. And uh, we lost, uh, the architect of OTN, Ron O'Dor, to COVID. Um, so this is something that you know has, has impacted all of us in, in in various ways. But I want to reflect on COVID because we have uh, we've also learned to do science and collaborate and communicate in a in a very different world. And there are some lessons. Uh, that can be learned and taken forward as we think about sustainable transitions and how we do science, how we should be doing science, uh, and, and so on. So as you reflect on the last few years and doing everything you do, not just the science, but the sharing, the data management, the collaboration, project development, all of the things that it means to be part of uh, OTN, uh, what have you learned that you can take forward in your in your approaches uh, and uh, apply them? So at the end of the day, we get better science and you know more impactful science. So uh, where do I want to start? 
Karen? Um, I think resilience for the community. Um, we managed, we, we were very lucky to continue managing the system at a level that we were happy with. So we managed to get our equipment out of the water, equipment back into the water with relative ease throughout the whole of, of the COVID duration. So we were very fortunate of that. Um, and then with, <laughs> with COVID came both the curse and a blessing of uh, online connectivity with everybody where everybody thinks you're available 24 seven, but it also made it possible to communicate that much more effectively with people. So you realize even now that you don't necessarily have to be in a room with a person. It, it is always more beneficial seeing people face to face. But if you wanted to have a small group meeting, you can quickly say, okay, let's jump online, let's go. Let's throw around some ideas. So it was nice that, you know, online platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and everything became available and developed at such a pace that we were able to, to um, efficiently kind of carry on doing doing what we were doing. Um, yeah, there was another point, but I, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone now. Okay. I'll come back to it. All right, Tom. I'm probably just going to piggyback on what you're saying, which is, well, I'll say this. People people that I previously did not trust to be able to do more technical things, they can do it. They can learn how to use Zoom. They can learn how to yeah. hold meetings <laughs> from a distance, teach classes from a distance. They're able to do it in a pandemic environment. So um, kind of restored some of my trust in, in those, those abilities. But yeah, I... I it, it has been super, super helpful, especially starting a new node and having to do that from a distance of 6,000 miles uh, to be able to hop on a quick call with, with OTN support, you know, early, early in the morning before they're off. But uh, yeah, that, I don't think I would have had such an easy time doing that prior, prior to the, the pandemic. Very, very narrow silver lining. Thanks. Uh, well, we rely a lot on tourism, like in terms of the citizen science expeditions, because we work in very isolated areas. So in order to go to Darwin and Gala like Darwin and Wolf or go to Cocos, we rely on the liveaboards. So not having uh, these uh, opportunities to go and take the receivers and like do the maintenance really affect the network uh, for two years. However, I think that also gave us a new approach, no? how we can build networks or like think about uh, what we need in order to don't rely 100% on tourism. No? And also for the communities, a lot of the conservation work we do is to convince some of the shark fishermen to stop catching sharks and work on other alternatives. And one of them is tourism. But knowing that this could happen again, hopefully not, is like how we can create uh, other alternatives for the fishermen that doesn't really rely on tourism. So uh, I think it's important for us to to work ahead and and to propose new new ways. Like I think at least in Mexico and then in developing countries, having these uh, ways to distribute food, to distribute fish to the other people was something that really helped the community to, to survive and to be able to pass through all these difficult times. Great, thanks Frida. Chris? So I think Tyron said it very eloquently, resilience. I, I was just amazed by the response of when they shut everything down, uh, the resilience of all the researchers to find uh, new and creative ways to get out on vessels, to go retrieve receivers, and to make sure we didn't have any major hiccups. They asked me like what the COVID impacts were. And I just looked at them. I was like, well, we didn't lose any data. We didn't maybe tag as many fish as we wanted to. But to be quite honest with you, I think the impacts in that respect were fairly minimal. Um, but, but I think that the bigger thing it taught us is that, yes, we can be very flexible. We can do meetings online. But, you know, there, there's also this, this component that's missed. And I don't think it's a big deal for, uh, you know, seasoned researchers who are used to working with one another, because again, there's that relationship there, there's that trust, there's that, hey, we're just going to get this done. But for the new people coming into the field, you know, because there was a lot of turnover, not establishing that rapport with researchers, it's just not the same online. 
you know, and so prior to uh, the COVID shutdown, I was making it a point to try to go out and see all the uh, management agencies around the Great Lakes base and just making road visits and, you know, shaking hands and talking with them. I had to put that on hold for two years. and I'm looking forward to resuming that because I think that at, at the end of the day is, is a real key to the success, at least with GLaDOS, because everybody depends upon the receivers and, you know, pulling off these collaborative projects. So, I mean, we held two years of uh, annual conferences or meetings online with record attendance, which was phenomenal. But, you know, we all joke we didn't get the bacon wrapped scallops at the venue that we always go to. And so that was a, certainly a huge downer. So, I mean, I think it, it showed it brought people, you know, it brought the best out of people in a lot of respects. But it's not I don't think it's really a sustainable way of doing research in the future. Great. Thanks, Chris. There's a couple of things I'd like to, to add on there. Um, one is. I'm fascinated with human behavior and behavior change and the effectiveness of regulations and messaging and nudges and so on. And I think the public health measures that we saw enacted in various ways in different contexts with, you know, uh, there's a lot of learning to be done that I think will inform broadly what we can be doing as folks that care about the environment to yeah, manipulate human behavior at the end of the day when we're talking about you know <laughs> ending up with a, a world that we can continue to live in uh that's going to be a big part of it so i'm hoping there's some learnings that come from that in sort of that human behavioral science side of things um, the other is kindness and uh, certainly realizing that if you're a team leader or a team member, that everybody is going through something at, at, at any point in their, their life, any day, and, you know, and that if things aren't, aren't uh, um, healthy uh, on the home front, that they're not going to be able to engage in a meaningful way in science. And, and we want to be keeping people in our community. We want people that have committed to science, that are passionate about science, that are passionate about tracking, to stick with it. We don't want people, uh, people uh, leaving. We want we want to keep our community together and grow it. And I saw kindness in so many different ways. And I had uh, one student who started and uh, uh, essentially right right uh, just before the pandemic hit and. Uh, all of her thesis plans were were sort of thrown in the, the garbage and we had to start from scratch and we were not able to go in the field to collect more data. And uh, a government scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, Tom Pratt said, hey, I've got some data for you. And that student was able to get a thesis and is now employed at DFO. And that's, you know, that's kindness. You know, there is no obligation to do that. Uh, um, it, it caused him work because all of a sudden he had to help uh, get us up to speed on that data set and what needed to be done. But uh, I saw a lot of that, a lot of sharing and sort of building support. So I'm hoping that's something that we can keep as a community. I would like to think that our our this community here, our tracking community is already full of a, a bunch of kind, supportive, uh, helpful folks. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to welcome more folks into the fold that uh, also uh, um, have those same uh, uh, also bring more kindness to the, the room. So um, with that, we are at the end of our time. I would like to check the chat. I've given folks in the room an opportunity to engage a couple times, but I'm not sure if there's any chat questions up there. There are not. Okay. Any last burning questions or comments before we wrap up? All right, huge thanks to all of you, but especially the panelists that are uh, sharing the stage and screen with us today. Really appreciate you for all of your thoughtful insights and your time. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.